or the player maker LinkedIn or Twitter in and the um, Twitter in and Twitter and then you'll find the link to Facebook Live on there as well ahead of the uh, the research talk. So thank you very much, Matt. And we should have uh, David Johnson online now. Hi, yeah. David. Are you all right? Yeah. Yes, good. Thank you. Yeah, good. Do you have any questions for Matt before we crack on with your research? Um, I, I thought it was a really interesting presentation and I just think that a lot of the work that you're doing is really important and often people overlook all those sort of nitty gritty little elements of the GPS systems they're using and how that might affect the results that are coming out and then obviously we're linking it to the visual stuff and how we can then link all our information as sports scientists to what coaches see is really important so I really appreciated the presentation really. Uh, thanks for that Dave and I agree it's really exciting but most importantly it's hopefully helping you guys and the coaches and you know the, the pitch facing people really that, that's what it's all about sports science it's helping people on the field yeah definitely. exactly and making sure we've got that physical output alongside the ball interaction and the video alongside it is just yeah we should be trying to utilize that more within our training processes to do do ourselves justice and give the full picture as well so thank you very much matt i'll um i'll drop you a little mute now but really appreciate your time and if you're going to bed sleep well um David, I'm muting myself instead of Matt, sorry about that. Um, so David, if you can now, uh, I will stop sharing the screen and if you want to share your presentation and get going. Thank you very much for your time, yep. by the way. Um, so David, for those guys that don't know, David is the Academy Sports Science Scientist at AFC Bournemouth in England. He's been doing uh, a fair bit of research into the bioban, and like, there's been a bit of uh, Twitter coverage of it as well. So I've kept up with it from afar, but so I'm looking forward to seeing uh, David's talk now. So, David, over to you. Thank you. Yes, thank you for the introduction. Um, just get this up. Yep, that's all I can know. Yep, all good. Um, so, the first of all, thanks to Steve, Playmaker, and all the other presenters for giving up their time in arranging this conference um, and all these talks. It's been really insightful so far this morning and I'm sure there'll be plenty more other good bits throughout the day. Um, as Steve said, I am the Academy Sports Scientist at AFC Bournemouth, um, but I also have a role as a PhD student at the University of Bath, where my research interest is around growth and maturation and particularly my PhD is focusing on how that would relate to injuries in academy football players that we have at the club. Uh, so to start, I'm just gonna give you a little bit of information on some of the previous research that's out there and about growth and maturation. So growth and maturation for adolescent footballers is highly variable and they're not the same concepts. Um, growth is the growth of the body and in terms of size, whereas maturation is progress in terms of the body's development towards an adult state. Growth has been associated with injuries in a few previous studies, and this has highlighted that a high growth rate during adolescence is associated with non-contact and growth-related injuries in this population. Maturation, similarly, has been associated with non-contact and growth-related injuries as well. Essentially, that a period of peak height velocity, which is the adolescent growth spurt, is associated with the rapid changes of the body and therefore more at risk. Next, um, with regards to training volume, which my study is also about, is that there seems to be a real lack currently in understanding training volume and training load within adolescent football populations. So this study here that I'm gonna to talk to you about today is looking at how growth, maturation and training volume all affect injury incidents within academy football players. So just to give you a bit of background about the method of the study, uh, we monitored 51 academy football players across a whole season. Um, this included players from under 13s, 14s, 15s and 16s and we monitored their growth and maturation throughout this time as well. So we monitored growth and maturation at um, every three months at a minimum and obviously then aligned this with the training uh, volume data that we had on the players as well. 
We then use general li linear mixed effects models to assess the um, associations between growth rate, maturity status, where we've used the Kamish Roche method, and then also week to week changes in volume and how those relate to injury risk within this population. Also, just to note that um, all stats within this study were done using R and R. Our studio and that all the injuries included within the, this analysis were non-contact time loss injuries. Um, so the first main finding of this study was that growth rate was um, significantly associated with injury incidents within this population. So on the left here you can see that the injury likelihood along the y-axis and then growth rate along the x-axis. This is in center in a rate of centimeters per year, and where you can see the mean growth rate and then high values on the right of the graph and low values for growth rate on the left of the graph. As you can see that at these higher values, um, there's an increased likelihood of injury within this population. And also, I think a really novel finding of this study compared to previous research is that we didn't use a cutoff value to define players as high growth rate or low growth rate, but rather compared different rates of growth across the range. This shows again that a growth rate of 9.3 centimeters per year is less risky than a growth rate of 13 centimeters per year. Um, essentially suggesting well, that- Hi, yeah, there's yeah, great work first of all, Steve and colleagues for um, putting this event, putting on the event. Uh, I to you guys the success, um, the success that you've had. Uh, in the number of people that have registered. So, yeah, congratulations. Um, so I'm Adam Field, a PhD candidate at the University of Huddersfield. And uh, today I'll be presenting one of my... Um, Steve? Sorry. Um, <laughs> it was just coming through with Adam Field's stuff at the minute. Sorry. Can you still hear me? Yeah, all good. Okay. Um, so I was just explaining that the higher the growth rate, therefore the more risk of injury and that an arbitrary cutoff value might not be enough in terms of injury risk. David, can you share your screen again? Sorry, please. Uh, just... See that I'll share. There you go. Sorry about that. I don't know what happened with that. So um, yeah, crack on. Yeah. Oh, um, so, so next, um, moving on to maturation and maturity status. Um, so again, you've got injury likelihood on the left here, um, and then maturity status going across the bottom, which was in this study we used percentage of adult height. For those of you that are unfamiliar with this. Um, we generally see um, peak height velocity occurring at 90 to 94%. So that's where the mean value is there in the middle. And then pre-peak height velocity being on the left at values lower than uh, 90%. And then post-peak height velocity being on the right at values greater than 94%. Um, as you can see, there was a significant non-linear relationship between injury likelihood and percentage of adult height within this population. Um, this suggested that the time of peak height velocity based upon these percentages was associated with a greater likelihood of injury within this population. Um, again, with there being a decreased risk pre-peak height velocity and an increased risk post-peak height velocity. Then moving on to the train, uh, training volume information we collected. So um, like the previous gra two graphs, you've got injury on the left and then week to week changes in volume along the bottom. Um, this week to week value essentially is giving us information on the change in the number of minutes from one, one week to the next. So in the middle there, you've got a mean of four, which is essentially um, no no change in volume or an increase of four minutes between one week and the next. And then on the right, you've got increases in volume where they've done more minutes than the preceding week. And then on the left, you've got a decrease in volume where they're doing less minutes than the preceding week. Um, as you can 
C, there was an increased risk associated with increasing in training volume within this study. And then also there was a, a decreased risk with a reduction in training volume. Um, this is obviously important so we understand how training volume changes for our adolescent players, but also that um, potentially deloading the players at some points might be beneficial. So just to give a little summary about the findings and the discussion on these. Um, firstly, that as the faster the growth rate of a player, the more likely they are to sustain an injury. Next, the period of peak height velocity was associated with increased risk of non-contact injuries within this population as well, when compared to pre and post peak height velocity. And then finally, increases in training volume from one week to the next were associated with an increased likelihood of injury. So the next stage of my PhD was to take these risk factors and apply them in a real world setting using sort of uh, a multidisciplinary team to therefore impact what um, injuries we were seeing within the academy. So firstly, we identified risk factors, which I spoke to you there in that first study. So identifying growth rate, maturity, and then also changes in training volume as our risk factors. We then um, took this information and reported it to coaches and this then became important within our planning for both this throughout the season, but also within weekly sessions where coaches understand the individual needs of each player based upon their current growth and maturation and these red flags. This planning has then led us to a training week where we have modifications for certain players who are experiencing increased growth or flagged as having incre uh, increased risk because they're during their peak height velocity phase and therefore subsequently changing their week and working on other um, injury prevention strategies in instead. This has also led us to um, adapt our training periodization, both from a weekly perspective, but also a season perspective to understand where um, changes in training volume should occur and to what degree these should change from week to week. Um, this has also helped us with regards to return to play and especially communicating these findings to coaches so they can understand if a player has had a period um, of no training, either through a Christmas break or a summer holiday or through injury, therefore that we need to follow specific return to play um, protocols in terms of how many minutes they're doing as they come back. So, and then on to the next steps of this research. So this data was from two seasons ago. In the current season that's um, unfortunately being cut, cut short, um, we, have been, we have developed this intervention and we're um, modifying training based off those risk factors. So we're then going to identify whether this has subsequently reduced injury incidence and injury burden and also identify whether players who are pre growth spurt, during their growth spurt and post growth spurt have different responses to those changes in training load. Cheers, David. Thank you for that. Uh, yeah. And um, just, yeah, thank you for allowing me the chance to present. And I've put some two QR codes up there if anybody wants to find out more about my research or contact me through Twitter if they have any questions. Thank you, David. I'm sure you'll get quite a bit of interest with the amount of biobanding uh, research going on at the minute. Like our research groups doing that as well. So I'm sure uh, I de definitely know Chris Towson or one of our research group will be in touch. So thank you. Yeah, um, quick transition. Uh, so Wuta, can you hear us? Uh, yes. Uh, you might need to turn up your microphone, David. Thank you again. Wuta, can you uh, share your screen now, please? Screen now, please. Yeah. Um, so I need to start the video. Uh, no, you can just uh, click on share screen in the middle. Ah, yeah. So no, no need for the video. It just sometimes it'll, the video will slow down the connection. Should be. I have some problems with the preferences. Uh, no. No problem. So um, what I'll 
do if you want to talk around uh, your presentation and then what we'll do we'll share um we'll share the slides out afterwards and uh, i'll just have this on in the background if you want to talk about your research uh, while the settings are there um yeah of course no problems uh, so my research my background is in um, endurance sports like most of you guys i have an background in triathlon um in team sports uh, well my background is in triathlon which poses some challenges um, that are different than you can experience in um, in team sports the main thing is that in triathlon we we need to work with a, a very limited budget so often the the coach is the, the same person as the sports scientist and he is also monitoring training loads and making all the decisions uh, what is different though is that um, the coach is often present at every training session um, and makes adaptations at the spot another structural difference is that our training groups in triathlon are international and they are often training abroad with international training groups that means that direct competitors for um world cup podiums or um, world championship actually train together the whole year and only on the starting line they uh, consider themselves as rivals our competition period is quite different to um, to football so we have more or less eight to twelve races during a year with one or two peak races but given the, the current situation of the world triathlon series it's important to be in a great shape all year round as every race contributes an equal amount of points um, to be able to win the world title. To put it into a um, perspective, our races are around one hour. Those are the short races and the longer races are two hours. So I'm still on the, the short distance triathlon. Um, and those are continuous races. The training that is involved in triathlon um, it's an average training load of around 25 hours a week, uh, but it can go up in, until 30 hours. So those are fairly common to, to see numbers to see. Not all of athletes go below 20 hours of actual endurance training a week. So I've done uh, some of my internships uh, for my masters um, in, some of the best triathlon groups in the world with multiple uh, world champions. And a few, uh, a few remarks stood out to me. First of all, in the groups that I've uh, visited, there was no structured physiological testing at all. And the coaches didn't think it was necessary to know their athletes better. And even argued that the physiological testing didn't give them the, re the right results as athletes were not giving them their, their maximal efforts or were not motivated uh, to perform the, the testing. The, the periodization, um, they were not doing any micro periodization. Um, so they were always trying to hit a high level of fitness all year round. Of course, during the peak races, they tried to increase it a little bit. Remarkable though was that although they didn't have a micro periodization, they did have a weekly recurrent structure. And how did they individualize training sessions was actually less than you would expect from an individual sport. So most of the training sessions were still done in group, uh, but were quite flexible. One of the uh, remarkable um, adaptations to training was that a lot of the interval sessions were performed as progressive sessions. So they started out uh, submaximal and then increase their speed um, gradually until every athlete reached his or her max um, for herself. Monitoring itself is quite difficult because we're handling three different sports at the same time. Sometimes all those three sports are performed on the same day, which all have different mechanical loads. And therefore they're extremely busy with watching the athletes, observing their movements, listening to any feedback and then on the spot trying to adapt and adjust their sessions and um, so that those were the the main lessons that i've learned there 
next I was um, I was arguing or going to argue that the the current training process frameworks have a few gaps uh, to me. One of um, the main gaps is basically that it doesn't take into account uh, the iterative nature of the training process, that multiple stressors happen at the same time. And also that uh, if we use the data, so the external training load data or the internal training load data um, to model any changes in fitness or fatigue, uh, do not reflect really well um, the actual state of the athlete. As an athlete is, as mentioned in previous presentation, and a human being and has a lot going on. So a lot of individual characteristics, um, psycho-emotional states, the cognitive, cognitive states, um, nutritional factors need to be taken into account to be able to discuss the, the adaptation. While the mechanical training loads or the, the heart rate doesn't take the, those really well into account. Cheers. Cheers the, Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, the last thing that I would like to um, to close on is that today we're a lot focusing on going from theory to practice, although I would argue that it's also really important to try to go from uh, practice to theory and give coaches a, a central role in, the, in, in research and actually try to listen to their experience and how they visualize the training process and how they actually monitor athletes and try to gather all this through uh, qualitative studies and gain or implement a new theory from that. Cool. Cheers, Wouter. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you. Um, what we'll do, we'll share, we'll share your presentation and I'll drop you an email yeah. just to um, see if we can solve things. But thank you for no your time. No worries. Harry, Thank are you, you there? Got, got you, Steve. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. I'm going to stop sharing the screen so you can share as well. Awesome. Awesome. Any any issues, just give us a shout, but hopefully that works fine. Um, yeah, so for the rest of the audience, apologies, we're running a little bit behind. We'll be able to catch up, so we should be back on schedule by about half 11, I believe, as well. Um, so, all being well. Should be good now. Is there any issue? There you go, Harry. Oh, working. Cool. Away you go. Awesome. Um, thank you for having me, Steve. Appreciate it. Uh, today, I'm going to some, present my PhD data um, uh, aimed around looking at the assessment of muscle glycogen stores in uh, team-based sports. So before we get into it, sort of some initial sort of information around this is why is the measure of muscle glycogen important? And to start off straight off the bat, we, we know that it's well established that high, high carbohydrate availability improves not only endurance, but high intensity in intermittent exercise, such as team-based sports. And as such, the practice of carbohydrate loading to supercompensate muscle glycogen stores, days leading into, days of games, is some of the key cornerstones of sports science practices. And currently, or initially, the, the assessment of that in athletes is, is something we've not been able to, to do readily or availably. And with that, there was some recent or some early research that came out looking at the use of an ultrasound technique to, to measure muscle glycogen. And that was using the notion of a grayscale and through it's the muscle glycogen's association with water, trying to assess uh, muscle glycogen in, in ultrasound through this assessment of the water content and in, in turn the grayscale. So from this initial work, there was some data they are published that showed a really positive correlation between a, a change in ultrasound score and in turn a change in muscle glycogen. So with an increase in muscle glycogen change, there was a, a, a correlative response in the change of the ultrasound score. In addition to that, there was some other recent work from uh, a cycling, cycling amount of exercise pre and post showing that a significant, a significant decrease in muscle glycogen stores pre to post alongside a changing muscle glycogen, changing ultrasound score, again, showing a positive correlation. So from, this, from, from the basis of that, we, we decided to try and assess the, the, uh, the reliability or the reproducibility of the ultrasound technique. Now, the data I'm going to present to you here has been published in 
in this paper and now I'll, I'll dive into it straight away. So the first part of, of the paper was, is the ultrasound method reproducible? Does it give you the same score? So we did a, a test retest over 100 subjects, 60 minutes apart in a supine position, having, exp having uh, undertaken no, no change in exercise status. Uh, and what we subsequently found is that across the vast, the vastus lateralis, across th three different positions, 25%, 50%, and 75%, along the RF, the rectus femoris at 25, 50, and 75, and looking at the, the VM at 50%, the 50% of the, va the vastus lateralis length and 50% of the width was the most reproducible landmark for the assessment of, for ultrasound assessment of muscle glycogen. So taking it from, from the lab setting and really emphasizing on this, this research to practice aspect, we then took it into, a, into, a, into the field. And the question we were asking is, is, it, is an ultrasound technique able to detect changes in muscle glycogen pre to post a rugby league game? So as you can see in the, the above image, uh, subjects were exposed to a, a pre-game pre ultrasound scan and muscle biopsy. And the data showed that we saw a significant decrease in muscle glycogen pre or post game, as we would expect. And the subsequent ultrasound score showed no change. And taking the previous work, we assessed the change in ultrasound score in conjunction with the change in muscle glycogen. And again, we saw no correlation. So we asked the question of whether, whether the conditions within the rugby league game, whether contacts, whether numerous other factors were influencing this, this or the ability to detect uh, muscle glycogen for ultrasound. So, so, subsequently, we then took it back to the lab. And from that, we, we, we start to ask the question that if we have individuals in states of high and low muscle glycogen availability, can the ultrasound method detect differences in, in a rested muscle? So we saw that in the, in the rugby league game, which is not a rested muscle, so muscle that's been under stress, is that influencing the ability to detect or the ultrasound method to detect muscle glycogen? So we took it back into the lab and performed a study where we had subjects arrive at the laboratory on, on day one, a scan pre and post a glycogen depletion protocol. Subjects were then either exposed to a low carbohydrate or a high carbohydrate meal for, for that evening. In the low group, subjects would again come into the lab in the morning, uh, ultrasound scan pre, ultrasound scan post, another depletion protocol. And then following that, it would be a, a low carbohydrate diet. In the high group, subjects would be exposed to a high carbohydrate diet for 36 hours, returning on the next day on day three, where we'd have an ultrasound scan and a corresponding muscle biopsy. So we can see that it's a, we're exposing the individuals to high and low carbohydrate availability alongside the, the assessment being an arrested muscle. And subsequently we found that we got subjects in both high and low carbohydrate availability and high and low muscle glycogen, and they were both significantly different between groups. We also assessed muscle water content with the notion that the ultrasound technique was assessing the water content in correlation or in conjunction with muscle glycogen. So we, we looked at the muscle water content, and again, we found no, no differences between groups. And subsequently, in the ultrasound score, scores were relatively similar, and there was no significant difference between between the high and low availability. So we saw that muscle glycogen was different. Unfortunately, the ultrasound technique was unable to detect the differences. So from those first three studies, we took, um, and from that data, we can, we can make the assumption that the data demonstrate that the ultrasound is not valid to measure muscle glycogen status, following an exercise-induced muscle glycogen utilization, and, mo and more traditional methods, as we can see in the image, of muscle glycogen assessment should be used. So unfortunately, we were unable to ascertain that the ultrasound technique can, can measure muscle glycogen, and we subsequently took it to much more traditional methods. And luckily, it was enough to go and work over in Australia and continue my study. And the AFL is a very under-researched under population in terms of nutritional recommendations and, in, and the nutritional requirements of, of play. So one of the first questions that we asked in, in study four, we, we asked the question of what are the current nutritional recommendations and how can we better understand the, nutrition, the, the nutritional recommendations using traditional methods? And 
the, the first study, and this is unpublished, it's in review at the moment, um, we asked the question, of, what are the current nutritional practices of AFL players? So during the home and away weekly fixture, across, uh, across a week, we had GPS and food diary analysis for four days. And we began to look at what are, what are the current practices of, of AFL players from, from a nutritional standpoint. Um, what we saw and what you would expect to see is, is a periodization of load across the week. A very similar for home and away game across total distance running, high speed running and sprinting, um, which is what you'd, you would expect to see. But then how does that affect the, from a nutritional point of view? So we can see that carbohydrate intake follows a very similar pattern. So players are, are carbohydrate loading for the required external load or the, or the upcoming event, I should say, whether it be the game, whether it be the highest training lo train load of the week. And those trends were similar across home and away, away fixtures. In addition to that, we also assessed exogenous carbohydrate intake and how that, how that was different between games and training. And as you can see, there's a, a much more of a reliance on exogenous carbohydrate fueling during games, as to be expected, um, with, a, with a higher reliance on fluid as opposed to gels. An interesting finding that, that shows that players are, if you will, adhering to a, a periodization of carb of carbohydrate relative to, to the required load and demands. So as I say, that, that paper is currently in review, but the data starts begin to demonstrate that AFL players do appear to practice elements of carbohydrate periodization, although it's difficult to ascertain if the habitual carbohydrate intakes reported here are conducive with optimal training adaptation. And that being said, it's likely that players do not consume sufficient carbohydrate intake on the day prior to match play. That's a statement that would appear correct in the sense of players are not optimally fueling to the recommendations that are suggested. And, and subsequently from that, our, our next question was, well, if, we, if players are not consuming enough carbohydrates prior to the game, what is the actual glycogen cost of an AFL game? What are the requirements of that AFL game? So, the next study that I'll present to you, is, and this is published in the paper, as you can see here, is looking at the utilisation of muscle glycogen during an Australian rules football game. So again, our question was, what is the muscle glycogen cost of, a, of an AFL play? So uh, in, a, in a case study, a case study um, design, we had two players that were on a similar position, both forwards um, of a similar weight, and they both consumed or were given the provision of eight grams per kilo of carbohydrate on game day minus one. Uh, they had a pre-game meal of two grams per kilo, four, hour, four hours pre, and then 60 minutes prior to the game play, um, both of the, the subjects were had a muscle biopsy taken. During the game, one player was, player A was given 54 grams per minute of carbohydrate, of exogenous carbohydrate, while one player, while the other player was given zero. And to really look at how much effect exogenous carbohydrate fueling has, um, on the muscle glycogen utilization. And it's safe to say not all players enjoyed the, the biopsy process. So what did, it, what did the data show? So from an external low point of view, we can see that the, the players generally had a very similar, similar output across the game, slight change in high speed running, but relatively similar, and especially from a, from a sprint distance perspective. Pretty much muscle glycogen was, was similar across both subjects. However, post-muscle glycogen was significantly different between both. And we can see that due to the fact that player B consumed 54 grams of exogenous carbohydrate and total, gly total glycogen utilization was significantly, significantly less in the, in the subject or the player that consumed the exogenous carbohydrate stores. So from that, what, what, what can we take from that? And what, can we, what does this data show us? It shows that Total glycogen use is greater than that reported in other elite invasion sports, such as soccer and rugby, which is to be expected with the increased uh, load and demands on, on the players. We, could, we can say that carbohydrate loading with 8 grams per kilo is sufficient to meet the metabolic demands of AFL play. And the previous suggestion of 10 to 12 grams taken from some of the, some of the carbohydrate recommendations out there is probably not necessary due to the amount of rotations and the the ability to get exogenous carbohydrate fuel stores on during AFL play. So if we take it back to the influence this has on, on recent to practice and, and sort of the, the mantra for today, 
our research question was, can we measure muscle glycogen non-invasively? We found out that we unable to, so we went through to traditional methods. We looked at the current nutritional practice of AFL players, also the glycogen cost, and then that influences that subsequently will influence sports science practice, sports science and nutritional practice within the AFL. Uh, just to finish, and I thank you for for listening. I've got a big thank you to Professor James Morton for um, a mentor throughout, throughout my time at university and Darren Burgess for my time at Port Adelaide and his time now at Melbourne. So thank you for listening. Barry, that's brilliant. Thank you very much for that and really insightful insights to your uh, to your presentation. You can stop sharing the screen before you go on to any of your uh, other desktop open books and uh, show us something that you don't want to see. <laughs> so, um, no, brilliant. We'll catch up with you a bit and if there's any questions, I'll send them across to you as well. Um, but hopefully awesome. we've got We've got, uh, I would say Thomas Craig, but Tommy Craig on the line. Yeah, Tommy's fine. Yeah, so um, over to you, Tommy, take it away. Yeah, just making sure you can hear me and this, the screen's been shared okay there, Steve? Yes, all good, Tommy, thank you. Right, thank you. Uh, firstly, thanks for the, the invite and for taking a chance on this strong Glasgow accent, being able to be heard and understood at the other side of the world. Really appreciate that. So I'm going to discuss of relative age and physical profiles of players awarded a professional contract within an elite Scottish academy. This essentially comes from, you know, 10 years of working with Falkirk FC, both as a sports scientist and then as their head of sports science, which was a program through the University of Stirling when I was there. So I'll start talking about, you know, talent ID and development and what it means for a, a club with limited financial resources, but about relative age effect, our testing methodology and the statistical methodology that we utilised the results and then the key thing which goes with the, the current conference theme is the application to practice. In terms of talent ID and development, it's it's long established that there's a range of parameters and predictors that we can utilise from the sociological predictors to psychological, uh, physical predictors and the physiological uh, predictors. So just to put into context the scale of a Scottish academy with you know severely limited resources, the overall academy spend is about a quarter million a year. Of that, the club put in less than six figures and uh, there's a range of sponsorship and grants available which cover the rest. In terms of sports science support, the club were paying roughly between 15 and £20,000 a year. That covered everything from testing, staff, my time, uh, facilities. So it was you know, quite a limited budget and the partnership with the University of Stirling at the time allowed that to, to thrive and grow. So with that limited budget, what sort of data were we creating and what could we do with it? Ultimately, we had the physical data which we felt was reliable over a 10 year period and we had that physiological data. So after a conversation with the, with the head of the academy, we were trying to find with the data we had, you know, what learning outcomes can we, ha can we take from that? What can we move forward to enhance uh, the resources that we do have? So initially looking at some of the existing research in terms of, you know, who's awarded a contract and who isn't, or who steps on to become an elite player and who doesn't. It's, it's well established in the reviews that there is a difference between elite and non-elite players in terms of the groups. So for example, you would have an elite if you compare that with an amateur uh, academy or a non-elite academy, you will see a difference between the physical outputs. Uh, James Dugdale and colleagues in 2019 have also shown this across the, a, a, you know, a real similar group and they utilised the Club Academy uh, Scotland structure in Scotland to be able to see that, that there was better physical performance in development and performance groups when compared with the amateurs. But when clubs and organisations have looked at who's gone on to be successful over a, over a period of time, the information is, is quite limited. And uh, Bergkamp and Bergkamp et al. Uh, released last year a phrase called the restriction of the, of the range when it came to talent ID and development. Part of the issue is that you're not looking at a large cohort, you're looking at individual groups. And this is reflected over the, the under 12 German Regional Performance Centre and the work that Honor done. Ultimately, they looked at a single under 12 assessment and then followed up eight to 10 years data. So the in-between information is missing. You know, similar with regards to the Austrian Performance Centre, there is an, an increase in performance across speed and power, 
uh, when you look at those international comp- those players that went on for international duty and those who did not, that's probably explained by the fact that we can establish that there's differences between an elite group and a non-elite group. Uh, and then within the elite skills programme, again in Germany, there's significant differences are, are, are across a range of physiological characteristics at the various age groups. But again, that's when you look at players who have progressed and players that have dropped out. Anything that's looked at professional contract status has predominantly been done in Spain, and it's only looked at the transfer from reserve team play into first team play. The other thing we had to have a look at uh, was the relative age effect. Uh, often it's attributed to size advantages of players born earlier in the year uh, through biological maturity. For those of you who aren't familiar with it, you could have a player who was born on the 1st of January playing against a player who was born on the 31st of December. From there, you're looking at a 12-month difference. And uh, there's an already biased pool there. So, for example, in the elite English academy system, there's a strong relative age effect bias as players are being recruited into that level. And that's also been observed in Scotland as well, both in terms of the recruitment into an elite Scottish academy structure and uh, throughout those academy players when you look at the overall cohort. So in terms of our testing methodology, uh, we had data gathered between 2007 and 2017. Uh, 2007 was when the Falkirk Academy was first established as an elite academy in the Cup Academy Scotland set up. The 2017 uh, kind of cut off was the change from Cup Academy Scotland to Project Brave. Uh, the procedures that we used for, stand, for testing were standardised throughout this time in terms of staff or who trained those staff, uh, the equipment, the time, the seasonal, the surface and the protocols that, that we use. So it's rare that we see that, that over a 10 year period, we have a single individual who's involved in all of these tests. We looked at anthropometric assessment, uh, counter movement jump was, was measured. We had 5, 10, uh, 20 metre sprint uh, data there and uh, yo-yo intermittent recovery, recovery level one test. We did have 505 data, which we decided against utilising because there was a change in the protocol about halfway through, which was dictated from the first team strength and conditioning coach at the time. Uh, in terms of the, the assessments that we did look at, validity and reliability for the equipment we're happy with, and they'd been established elsewhere with similar age groups with similar kit within football. So in terms of the statistical analysis, uh, we had uh, 2021 testing samples of which Players were, uh, 100 players were awarded professional status. Now, this professional status was uh, a first team appearance or a, or a professional contract. Uh, and how those players were made up, essentially with a range of players throughout there. So, you know, three players came through the whole pathway. Uh, 14 players came in at under 14s. 13 players came in at under 15s, as you can see there. And that's really important for a club with a limited budget that we are bringing, in, bringing through our own players who are coming in at U10s and U11s, but we're also in that position to recruit players who, for example, the old firm Celtic and Rangers have released uh, at those later age groups, bring them in, develop them to get them to a level that they can meet a professional status for a couple of Falkirk. So we, the associations were initially invest, in, assessed using multi-level uh, linear models, and in terms of predicting contract access, we modelled using a least absolute shrinkage and selection operator logistic regression, essentially because that uh, that reduces the chance. In terms of our performance predictors, uh, when we look at the chart, what we'll do now is I'll zoom into the, the main points that, that was a prediction of performance. So what predicted players being awarded professional contracts? Essentially, the main predictors were relative age uh, and height. That was the main predictors that we found that we found throughout throughout there. Obviously, there's a disappointment there with one of those main predictors being relative age, something that is completely controllable. What we did see when we look at the group as a whole, without splitting them into U10s, U11s, etc., the players that awarded a professional contract were an average 1.7 centimetres taller. Uh, they jumped 1.1 centimetres higher and they were slightly faster in a 20 metre sprint performance. Now, whatever parameter we look at, when we break that down into U10, U11s, U12s, there's no significant differences between the groups. And one of the questions that the Academy Performance Director had asked us to kind of answer is, can we include or exclude people on the basis of physical measurements? And if you look at the chart that we've got here, what you can see is a significant overlap between 
you know, players who have been awarded professional contracts and those who aren't. So if a player comes in and they're, you know, they're better physically, it doesn't mean they're going to get awarded a professional contract. Or if they're worse physically, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to get a, a, a contract as well. The next thing we did was we looked at, you know, what, which of those players represented the most value to the club over that period of time. So, uh, for example, here your player in, your, in the purple went over to play over 300 first team games. The player in the blue uh, was, was the, the record sale. And the player uh, just there at the under 17s, he was the second, rec second record sale, so second most transfer money that's come in, but we only recruited them at under 17s. You know, what you can see when you look at these players and if you select them individually is that, again, there's no clear pattern. You know, they aren't better than, than, than the range or the average of the players that, that we've got throughout the academy as a whole. The main thing where we did feel that we could influence ourselves moving forward was in terms of the relative age effect. So if you look at the players that have been awarded contracts, uh, about 75% of that has came from the first two quarters. But that's probably because we're already recruiting from a, a significantly biased pool. As you can see when you look at all of the players here on, on the, in the purple, you know, even if we look at just that first quarter as a whole, 50% of them that are awarded professional contracts were born between January and March. Again, when we look back towards, you know, these individual players, there wasn't really any any uh, impact on relative age of these players that, that represented the most value to the club. But that is an issue for an organisation with the limited resources, as I've suggested and as I've detailed, we need to be getting the most bang for our buck. And by excluding people both as they come into the academy and throughout the academy, you know, there's a, there's a potential indication there that it's due to relative age. So in terms of, uh, you know, the, our future elements for practice, the controlling effects of relative age and players were awarded contracts, although they were taller, you know, combined modelling for talent ID at this level with the information we had is not possible. Now, I'm not saying that the physical attributes aren't important, and we can see that between the, the difference between the elite groups and the non-elite groups and, uh, and other work. But academy practitioners at this level should look at up establishing other key talent identification and, and development priorities whilst addressing the relative age effects. That's a concern. Uh, when we looked at this as a, as a whole, based on the education that we, had, that we had previously done with coaches, with scouts, we didn't believe that we would have had a significant relative age effect. And we did. It just shows that we've got more work to do. Given the financial restraints for us, it's not possible for us to uh, manipulate age, age categories. We can't have, you know, six-month age bans, or if you look at what Seville do, they have an A squad for 13s, an A squad for, uh, I'm sorry, an A squad for 13s, a B squad for 13s, and a C squad that accompanies a, do, a dual age band. You know, we just can't do it. We don't have the financial resource for it. Uh, what can we do? Well, we can look at biobanding and the work done with Will Abbott down at Brighton has, has shown that, that that you'll get more short passing sequences and more dribbles for those late developers. So, you know, those who haven't haven't developed, uh, at, whereas the early developers, the bigger, stronger players, when we bioband players, there's an opportunity for more tackles and an avoidance of a long passing game. And that doesn't affect the physical demands negatively. In terms of educating scouts and recruitment department, we need to we need more work on that uh, as a club and as an organisation. And that is something that I have found when I've been speaking to other clubs and organisations who share these, share these some financial resources within that too. Just to put it into perspective, in terms of a club like Falkirk, what is the academy worth? As I said, we're spending about quarter million a year. When we look at total sales and uh, economy, so, for example, players that, you, that you've signed from within the club that you haven't had to pay a signing on fee, the salary is lower. Over the course of 10 years, that was about five and a half million benefit to the club. So it is really important that a club of this size with this limited resource is getting it right moving forward. And the main way for us to do that is to make sure that we're not a biased talent pool on the basis of relative age effect and not excluding anyone on the basis of physicality. Uh, we're looking to move this one forward, so if anyone does have any uh, any input or wants to communicate with us, that's uh, my contact details and Paul Swinton, who's uh, the statistician that ran the stats on this, and we'd be really keen for you to engage either via email, via Twitter, or through the other appropriate channels. 
There you go, Steve. I got you your time back. <laughs> Cheers, Tommy. I knew I could rely on you to get us back in time, so thank you very much for that. And uh, yeah, brilliant presentation. Like um, uh, for the for those of you that might not be from the UK, I will be translating that uh, into English for you guys. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding, Tommy. So thank you very much. And we should have uh, Johan on the line. Yep. That's Hi, Johan. Correct. Hi, how uh, are you? Yeah, good. Thank you very much. Do you want to share your screen? That's all right, please. Yes. Great. Oh, all looks good. I can hear you. can see it. Away you go. Okay, perfect. Uh, thanks again for, uh, for inviting and organizing this event, Steve. Uh, I will we presenting a case study about a rewarm up and most uh, uh, I will deal mostly about the practical insights of the implementation process of the rewarm up in an, in an elite team setting. So the agenda, uh, I will start a little bit with the context and the ignition of the actual case, uh, the research and application, uh, establishing buy-in and also uh, a going on to, to conclusion or summary after that. Uh, speaking of this and all, uh, listening to all the presentations, I also want to highlight that I will be speaking at the level of application with uh, different external factors, culture, previous experiences, views, and so, and so forth. And I will present a little bit of how we implemented We Warm Up in Half Time. So for the, for the listeners, uh, so to be able to zoom out and think how can you apply maybe the principles, uh, the objectives uh, and the logical reasoning in, in your environment. That's uh, the first saying. Moving on, uh, the moment of ignition for this case study was uh, at the preseason camp training in Dubai, where we, uh, at my former club, AIK Football, we had a... Uh, a meeting with the Shakhtar Donetsk uh, a team that we uh, faced that uh, challenged us in many ways. And in half time, uh, they did a rewarm up, which made us aware of something that we didn't use uh, yet. So we get, uh, come, came from an unconscious incompetence level and we were aware of our conscious incompetence at that time. Uh, during the halftime, they uh, performed a rewarm up, and just after the, the halftime break, they caught us directly uh, and uh, scored a goal on us. And the, the feeling uh, at the players was shit. Uh, something, something, uh, something happened at halftime. We saw them do something. Okay, so we need to uh, uh, be aware that the players experienced something. So that was the moment of ignition. So we, we looked into the research and the research supports uh, something for, for doing something in the, in the uh, half time. So the studies from Ed Holm, Kristrup and, and Runders, uh, which I was a part of when I was a PhD student. Um, we did a crossover study with 22 players uh, with two games in between. And then we looked at some, some performance indicators and the conclusion was that traditional passive half-time rest leads to impaired sprint and jump performance during the initial phase of the second half in professional soccer players. Then we could uh, see on the uh, figure on the, on the right that, okay, so we, knew, we know there's something uh, in this to do in the half-time. How then, how do we do it? How's the application look? Well, then we can look at uh, the, the nice chart from John Lemur, which sort of highlights visual how it's going to look uh, during halftime. Because this, this is going to affect not only the players, but the head coach, the physio, uh, and a lot, of the, a lot of parameters around the team and also within the team. So we concluded that we had a roughly about four to six minutes of rewarm up uh, on the field. And in, in order to establish buy-in, we needed to get the players, the head coach, uh, the physio, uh, all in line uh, to be able to buy into this and also um, support what we now uh, consider to be an upgrade in our uh, way of working. So we need to be aware of the confirmation bias. That's now uh, something that 
we are not doing we are not doing or trying something and then how can we then evaluate it uh, and avoid maybe to go into body Maddie, what do you got a lot like of discussion Geronimo. and yes. opinions. Hey, guys, an athlete, big, fast, talented. Top of mind was clean cut, good face. Yeah, good job. Five tools, guys. Good looking ball player. Can he hit? Yeah, he's got a beautiful swing, right, Barry? Ball explodes off his back. He throws the club head at the ball, and when he connects, it he drives it. It pops off the bat. You can hear it all over the ballpark. A lot of pop coming off the bat. And if he's a good hitter, why doesn't he hit good? He is a good hitter. Minor leaguer. He'll be. He'll be ready. Yeah, so he's going to be a good hitter. When he... Okay, so I will not bore you anymore with the Moneyball uh, movie, but it raised the uh, metaphor uh, of us having to look at some, some things um, meaningful and try to be as objective as possible. And for our sake, we took an easy example. We could have taken a lot of uh, things, but we took an easy example uh, that we looked at the amount of goals scored and amount of goals conceded in that uh, time uh, after the half time uh, break so the 15 minute time because uh, after that then then the team is uh, sort of on the on the same level as catching up so that's what we looked at on the on the first hand and we also looked at of course what's on the other side do we conceive more uh, when do we conceive and Looking back on this, we implemented something that we weren't doing the two previous years. So we had to look at the statistics and we look at the statistics back from 2016, where we could see uh, a just goal distribution uh, of when did we score. And we had in that uh, amount of time, 15 uh, time, uh, 0.3 percent or eight goals in that period. In the next year, following year, we had 8.5%, so four goals in that period. When we came to 2018, we implemented the rewarm up and suddenly uh, something changed. Um, our goal distribution was changed uh, rapidly. So we had goals going from an average of 11.9%, six goals, to an increase of uh, to a total of 26%, 13 goals uh, in the 15 minutes period in the start of the second half, which was an increase of 14% or seven goals in that period. Looking also, of course, on the other end, when we conceived. So we were looking back on 2016, which 11.5% uh, Thirteen point six percent, and when we came to uh, two thousand eighteen, uh, goals against stayed pretty much unchanged, so it was only one goal difference. So, to summarize a little bit, um, our strategy and our thinking was: okay, we experienced something. Okay, we, we need to research it. What's the research behind it? How do we implement it? Uh, how do we evaluate it uh, and look for objective and meaningful uh, measurements? And you can question uh, the causal effect of scoring goals, but it was a meaningful uh, experience for the players to actually see, okay, goals are the most valid thing in in the uh, terms of football, so it means a lot to them. So if they see that something is happening, that we're increasing our likelihood, then we, can, uh, then we will go uh, a long way to, to do it. And this uh, reinforced and enabled the storytelling to promote uh, performance culture, which made us go from a little bit more conscious competence to an unconscious uh, competence. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, and that was great. Oh. Uh, and I'm right. happy to take any questions uh, on email or uh, Twitter. Just let me know. Thank you, Johan. Really appreciate your time and that. Um, yeah, great insight. And again, another area that I'm really interested in. So I'll definitely be dropping you an email um, in regards to asking the questions.
questions on that. Um, really, thank you for your time. Like, uh, let's move swiftly on to the next one then. Uh, Dave, are you there? I'm here, Steve. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Like, I'm just waiting. Unfortunately, uh, our fellow presenter has got his kids with him, so let's just see if he's got them out of the room. Martin, can you hear us? Of course. You, yourself? Uh, yeah. Good morning to you both and hope you are both doing well. Um, Excellent. Yeah, thank you. The, the ability to multitask between a WhatsApp group and uh, hosting this <laughs> has been a challenge for me this morning, especially with what these two have been putting. Um, so I'll let, I'll let you guys uh, head on and present what this research is all about. So take it away. Perfect. Well, good morning, everyone. And uh, first of all, we hope everyone is safe and well and uh, the family and friends too. It's obviously a difficult time for everyone. And I suppose Dave, can you just speak up a bit, please? Sorry. I can speak up. Can you hear me? Thank you very much. Excellent. Okay. Well, it's, as I was saying, it's a difficult time for everyone. And I suppose what this um, community has done over the last few days to come together and support each other based on what you've done, Steve, it's fantastic. I, I suppose this is the performance community's band-aid moment with you in the role of Bob Geldof, um, showing that there's been been fantastic uh, goodwill from everyone to come together and, uh, and help each other. And and provide a real focus over the last uh, number of days. Um, what we've done here is put together with uh, Martin leading the way. It's a brief survey for people on the um, on the conference to complete. It, in essence, what we're looking for is practitioners to give us an indication on how they reflect on their own knowledge and experience, um, how they go about gaining additional knowledge, both in terms of how regular that is and the sources that they go to for that additional knowledge, and, and their orientation towards CD. For example, is this type of event that Steve has fantastically organized, is this a function of the current situation that we're in, or in the future, is this the type of event that people would be interested in doing? And also based on that, is there a monetary value that should be attached to it if it is going to be something that is going to be more regular? So the survey, which Martin's going to go through now, is it's only a brief survey. It'll take two or three minutes to complete. And we'd obviously encourage everyone to try and help out and, and give a little bit back to, to the survey and, and certainly to Steve. Uh, based on the hard work he's done. So with global max velocity, I will now hand, hand over to the um, the ever-present Martin Bouchard. <laughs> oh, Dave. No, th thanks for, yeah. So I don't, I don't think I have much to add, to be honest. Um, but thanks for the, the introduction and also many thanks for to Steve as well uh, to provide all of us the opportunity to share. And uh, it's just been amazing to see people from all over the world switching. At the moment, we didn't have any hiccup in terms of uh, technology, which is also amazing. So I would say that we are probably, probably now, we are, we are ready to, to, um, to be confined, maybe, with uh, the technology. But anyway, so back to our, our project. Um, yes, I think having really been deeply involved in, in the research for, for a while, um, I'm probably one of the most uh, frustrated uh, practitioner as well, looking at people around me, uh, but I mean, around me closely or from distance that just don't really use the research. Um, and we always talk about this gap between research and practice. And I think on both, on both sides, um, there are challenges, I would say, that researchers not asking the right questions and practitioners not really willing to listen or read probably because of the research question, but also the, the formats. And all the, the research question, as, uh, as Dave uh, nice, nicely explained, is about all of us trying to improve the, the, the overall question about how can we make materials, research materials, uh, better suited for practitioners. So what are we all looking for when we work in the pitch? Are we looking for more for research papers videos podcasts and so on so that's that, that's 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 the idea what do we use as practitioners as, as practitioners as main resources um so that we can all improve the the, the formats and uh, the content of what is proposed for people to to get uh, their own uh, development 
Um, so yeah, that's that's the survey, and it's only five minutes. So please, I really hope that everyone that is listening at the moment, and those who left, will have access to those uh, those those questions, and just spend a little bit of time and and helping us to to respond to, to better to those uh, those questions. And we will ob ob obviously put everything together in a, in a report and share that to to everyone. That's it for me. Thanks again. Boys, thank you, Martin. Dave, anything else as well? No, I, no. I think Martin's absolutely summed it up. I think it's a unique opportunity now for people to really, you know, dive in, give us the answers back, and hopefully we can help uh, formulate where potentially CPD can go in the future and, and, and how we can help uh, in the modern world use the best of technology, social media and so on, to to best give people the knowledge that they require and maybe that they're, they're seeking. Brilliant. Thank you, Dave. And thank you, uh, Martin and Dave, as well. Really appreciate that. It's, um, again, this, again, I seem to be doing everything like quite rapidly at the minute. So going back to uh, Yaron Coop's model of the um, slow, slow uh, academic versus the quick practitioner, like it's, uh, this is very much in between the most, whereas we talked about this idea purely because of the, the large audience that we were getting. So that's brilliant. Thank you both very much. While I'm here and before we take a short five minute break, um, just so everyone can stand up, have a stretch, um, then there's some other survey. So you will find it if you go into the chat box on the webinar, um, within the chat box, you will be able to see there's links to the surveys as well. So there's, um, as I mentioned on the presentation, if I just load them up, um, there you go. That's always first issue. There's one on recovery strategies. There's one on virtual reality, which I think just because I didn't uh, type in the full one, let's just have a look at that. Again, because we are now in an opportunity or we're in a confined environment, we're actually in a position now where we can help each other out and the different uh, links and stuff like that will take you straight into that. So even like Wouter, who was presenting earlier, who unfortunately couldn't share his screen, his presentation's there as well. So we'll make sure all these are shared through uh, my Twitter account and anyone else's social media platform as well. Um, but thank you, first of all, to all the speakers for the, the um, for the first half talk. And need to say, I think it's about time that we uh, had a half-time team talk. Um, Get the oranges out, get your Harry Burn sweets out, have a